tonight on News Center. Pouring salt on an open wound, Korea issues a strong protest against Tokyo's approval of updated high school textbooks that identify Korea's easternmost Tokyo Island as part of Japanese territory. North Korea launches mid-range missiles, another violation of UN resolution, triggering strong condemnations from Seoul, Washington and Tokyo. South Korea is seeking follow-up measures from the UNSC level. And another yearly highs. Seoul shares extend gains to a third straight day, closing the week on fresh 2016 highs. The Korean won also ends trading the strongest against the greenback. New Center begins right now. It is 9 a.m. in New York, 1 p.m. in London, and 10 on a Friday night here in Seoul. Hello and welcome to our viewers all across the globe. You're watching Arirang News Center. The Japanese government today announced the approval of updated textbooks to be used in that country's high schools next year. In the latest version, the textbooks wrongfully identify Korea's easternmost Tokdo Island as Japanese territory. Now, Seoul immediately issued a strong protest demanding Japan teach correct history to its youngsters. Our foreign affairs correspondent Kwon Soa has the latest development in Korea-Japan ties. Korea has sternly protested Japan's renewed and expansive claims that South Korea's easternmost island of Tokdo is Japanese territory. Seoul's foreign ministry summoned a Japanese minister from Tokyo's embassy in Seoul Friday in a demand to immediately repeal of its approval of textbook revisions. According to the review, out of 35 social studies high school textbooks to be issued beginning April 2017, 27 refer to Tokdo as Takeshima, the Japanese name for Tokdo, and claim Korea is illegally occupying the island. That's around 77 percent and a sharp rise from the 54 percent of textbooks in 2013. Upon the announcement, Seoul's foreign ministry denounced Tokyo's distorted historical view of the island, which, quote, historically, geographically, and by international law, is clearly South Korean territory. The Japanese government must realize that teaching history accurately is its obligation to not only Japan's future generations, but also to neighboring countries that suffered from Japan's history of invasion. Similar words were echoed by Seoul's education ministry, which cited the Japanese government's acknowledgement in 1877 that Tokdo does not belong to Japan. As Japan has been making its claims throughout the last decade, I don't think that our government's criticism and demand for rectification would change Japan's stance. So we must make use of additional methods, such as promoting Tokdo as our territory more often. That's also why Seoul's foreign ministry announced Friday it'll increase translations for subtitles of its Tokdo video into 13 more languages to the existing 12 to raise international awareness. Meanwhile, Seoul and Tokyo's recent landmark agreement on Japan's wartime sexual slavery has not been included in the textbooks yet, as the revision process came prior to the deal but is expected to be added after review next year. However, verbiage in some textbooks seems to dismiss evidence of the Japanese military's atrocities, raising concerns that further revisions will contain similar distortions of history. The government is urging Tokyo to squarely face history and show sincerity in its actions to open up a new chapter in South Korea-Japan relations. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. North Korea has again launched ballistic missiles, two of them, this time off the west coast of the Korean Peninsula. Now, the South Korean Joint Chiefs of Staff says one ballistic missile flew a distance of 800 kilometers over land toward the sea off the country's east coast, while a second projectile, assumed to be a missile, was detected by radar but soon disappeared. Mind you, this comes just days after the U.S. warned of tougher sanctions against the reclusive state for its previous nuclear and missile tests. Our defense correspondent Kim Yeonbin reports. 
North Korea launched two ballista missiles on Friday morning from Sokchon in the country's southwest. Military officials say the missile, presumed to be a medium-range Nodong missile, flew 800 kilometers before falling into the East Sea. The other missile was fired from the same location, but disappeared from radar at an altitude of 17 kilometers. A South Korean military official says it most likely malfunctioned and blew up in midair. We believe North Korea is rushing to develop a nuclear-tipped ballistic missile by the order of Kim Jong-un. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said the missile seemed to have been fired from a transporter reactor launcher, or TEL. North Korea last test-fired a Nodong missile in March 2014. It has a range of up to 1,300 kilometers, putting Seoul and Tokyo within striking distance. More concerning is that the missile warheads can be loaded with biochemical substances. The ministry says it's keeping a close eye on North Korea's nuclear and missile development and that it will maintain the highest readiness to instantly counter any threats from the regime. Military officials say that the recent launch seems to be in protest of the South Korea-U.S. annual joint military drills, known as Key Resolve and Full Eagle. Friday is the final day of Key Resolve, a computer program war game exercise that aims to enhance interoperability between the two allies. Full Eagle consists of numerous field training exercises and will run through the end of April. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Today's provocations by the North triggered quick and strong condemnations from South Korea, the U.S. and Japan. As it comes to spite U.N. sanctions and global efforts to halt the regime's nuclear and weapons ambitions, today's episode is raising concerns that what's been deemed the toughest set of sanctions Pyongyang has ever seen just may not be enough to stop North Korea from further provocations. Then what? Our Connie Kim reports. The international community condemned North Korea's latest provocation with one ballistic missile flying some 800 kilometers before falling into the sea off its east coast on Friday morning. South Korea's defense ministry called the launch a threat to peace in the international community. Our military takes the development of North Korea's nuclear and missile programs seriously. And Pyongyang's missile launch is a frontal attack against the UN Security Council resolution and a significant threat to peace and stability in the international society. Seoul said it'll push for follow-up measures on a UN Security Council level, pressuring the regime that it cannot survive if it does not give up its nuclear ambitions. The U.S. Pentagon called the launch a clear violation of multiple U.N. Security Council resolutions and called on North Korea to refrain from actions that further raise tensions in the region. Washington's State Department added the U.S. remains steadfast in its commitment to the defense of its allies, including South Korea and Japan. Tokyo quickly launched a protest with North Korea through its embassy in Beijing as one of the North Korean mid-range missiles launched on Friday hit waters within the Japanese air defense identification zone. Speaking in parliament, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe condemned Pyongyang's actions and warned of any further provocations. While demanding strongly that North Korea show restraint, we are making doubly sure that we can respond to any situation with our means, including strengthening our surveillance systems. North Korea's mid-range ballistic missile launches came following Pyongyang's claim that it has succeeded in miniaturizing a nuclear warhead to fit on ballistic missiles and claimed to have acquired missile re-entry technology. Seoul is keeping a close eye on the regime's moves as it sees a fifth nuclear test to be a possibility. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Russia's disapproval of different countries and unilateral sanctions on North Korea, its opposition against deploying a U.S. missile defense system on the Korean Peninsula, and the recent question mark that's been raised regarding a trilateral logistics project between the two Koreas and Russia. Now, all these topics have been drawing cautious concerns that South Korea Russia relations may be heading downhill. But Seoul's top envoy to Russia, Park no has reassured that these circumstances will not be a handicap in further developing relations between Seoul and Moscow. This during an interview with reporters this Friday. Now, he added that Moscow has not made specific comments to Seoul on the suspension of the Russian Kassan project, adding that it's more about the interests of those private firms involved in this project. Against the backdrop of continued threats from the north, President Park Geun-hye stressed the importance of law and order this Friday, calling on South Korea's law enforcement officers to put priority on enhancing public safety. 
Our presidential office correspondent Song ji Sun reports. There cannot be perfection in security readiness. But to protect ourselves from foreign threats, we must reinforce domestic safety first. That was President Park Geun-hye's message at a commissioning ceremony for police cadets. Park said every police officer must act as an agent for anti-terrorism. With North Korea's rising threats both in cyberspace and in the real world, which could cause social chaos if such terrorist schemes are executed. Saying the government's major reform and innovation drives can only succeed with strict law enforcement, she called on officers to help establish a clean and transparent society. The president then paid a visit to a shrine dedicated to Admiral Lee Sun Shin, a legendary naval commander known for his remarkable victories against Japanese during the Joseon dynasty. Paying tribute, Park wrote on the visitor's book that she will build a foundation for peace and prosperity on the Korean peninsula by succeeding the legacy of the heroic commander. Song ji -sun, Arirang News. Well, the Korean president also stopped by an assembly plant of Hyundai Motor Group, the fifth largest automaker in the world, together with its affiliate Kia Motors, on this Friday. Touring the assembly line, and President Park pledged to give full support to the development of driverless vehicles and eco-friendly cars, including electric vehicles, noting that the technological prowess of the country's car manufacturers as well as information and technology companies. The president's visit to this smart factory underscores her commitment to technological advancement amid public interest in artificial intelligence following a high-profile match of Padu Gorgo between an AI supercomputer and human champion Ise Dol. It also comes a day after she pledged to make all-out efforts for the development of intelligent technologies. Counting down to Korea's general elections now just 26 days away, Korea's political landscape continues to change by the minute, by the hour. Well, that may be an exaggeration, but by the day for sure. Some lawmakers are expressing discontent over their party's candidate nomination process by choosing to defect. Our parliamentary correspondent Shin Se-min brings us up to speed on the volatile political scene. The political turmoil continues at the parliament as major political parties continue to finalize candidate nomination for the upcoming general election on April 13th. Following delays in the candidate nomination process, several ruling Senori Party lawmakers have decided to leave the camp and announced that they will run as independent candidates. Among the defectors were high-profile politicians like Cho Hye-jin, perhaps a victim of his association with Yu Sung min the former floor leader of the ruling party, and part of the group at odds with the pro-president Park Geun-hye faction. Yeah. Yu Sung min and President Park clashed after the three-term lawmaker criticized the Park administration's promise to expand social welfare without raising taxes. Amid the ongoing rift between Pak loyalists and the non pak faction of lawmakers, the ruling party has delayed its announcement of remaining incumbent lawmakers' nominations, including you. The main opposition Minja Party of Korea continued its nomination process, announcing an additional nine candidates for inclusion on the ballots. 
The Minor People's Party also rolled out its fifth round of nominations, including Cheng Ho Jun, who joined the People's Party after failing to receive nomination from the Minju Party of Korea Tuesday. Chung's move to the People's Party allowed the minor bloc to form a parliamentary negotiations group by securing the required 20 incumbent lawmakers from the 300-strong National Assembly. With incumbent lawmakers changing political parties just less than a week before the two-day candidate registration session begins, prospects for the upcoming general election still remains unclear for the time being. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Seoul shares renewed their yearly highs on this Friday, a day after the U.S. Fed hinted at reducing the number of rate hikes expected this year, lifting investors' risk appetite. The local currency also finished trading at the strongest level so far this year against the greenback. Our Park Ji-won has the numbers. The benchmark KOSPI closed at 1,992.12 Friday, jumping more than 4 points, or 0.21 percent from Thursday. With Friday's increase, the Korean primary index saw its stock value rise for the third consecutive day. The last time the market closed above the 1990 mark was on Christmas Eve last year. The strongest showing in nearly three months is backed by investors' growing optimism over a weakening dollar and increasing oil prices as the U.S. Federal Reserve decided on Wednesday to keep its interest rates low. The uptick momentum was especially visible in construction, steel, and medicine-related shares. However, with institutional investors strong selling, the increase of stock prices has been somewhat limited. Korea's tech-heavy Kostek also reached its highest so far this year, finishing at 695.02. The Korean currency also closed trading at its strongest level this year, with the won standing at 1162.51 against the U.S. dollar. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Artificial intelligence has certainly taken the world by storm, showing it has the potential to open new frontiers and enhance daily life in ways never before seen. A future with AI will come with a price, it seems, as many are concerned that development of such technology could wipe out jobs for human beings. Just how do we foresee AI affecting the labor market? Our EG1 takes an in-depth look. The historic match between Korea's Paduk or Go Grandmaster Lee se and Google's AlphaGo left many in awe at how far artificial intelligence has come. But with AI becoming increasingly a part of modern-day life and showing endless possibilities, there are concerns that AI might one day take over human jobs as well. In fact, a number of studies by Deloitte and Oxford University show that telemarketing is the job most likely to be taken over by machines within the next 20 years. Next on the list are jobs requiring the use of keyboards, followed by paralegal work and a number of positions from other industries such as finance and administration. The results were based on certain qualities AI is expected to excel humans, such as finger dexterity, repetition, and computing skills due to their keen and exact calculations. Some experts, however, are optimistic and say that machines performing repetitive and tedious tasks will allow people to find more fulfilling jobs, improving their quality of life. Development of automobiles led to horses becoming obsolete, but it also resulted in jobs such as taxi and bus drivers. Technological advancements will drive people with innovative minds to create new markets and thus new jobs. A projection was made at the World Economic Forum earlier this year, showing that about 2 million new jobs will be created within the next five years thanks to artificial intelligence. The new jobs will mostly be concentrated in the science, technology, engineering and mathematics fields. Moreover, Internet of Things, nanotechnology and 3D printing industries have already resulted in unprecedented new job titles. Social media manager, for instance, is a job that's been recently created prompted by the expansion of social media networks on the Internet. But experts say with machines expected to replace simple labor, workers must be retrained to take on newly created jobs. Lee Ji-won, Arirang News. 
Now, we're learning today that the dwarf planet Pluto is more strange and fascinating than we had ever imagined. Analysis of data collected from NASA's space probe New Horizons reveals just how much more there is to explore our solar system. Our Quan Jiang Ho shares with us the latest findings. The big surprise is that Pluto turned out so surprising. That's what one of NASA's top researchers said about the object once known as the ninth planet. NASA released five new groundbreaking papers on the dwarf planet in Science magazine on Thursday, outlining the discoveries they made from the data sent by its space probe New Horizons. When they sent the probe on its three billion mile mission nine and a half years ago, NASA had no idea about the variety of terrain and geological activity on Pluto's surface. They discovered everything from flat plains to mountain ranges and underground oceans to ice volcanoes. There was even the discovery of a hazy blue atmosphere faintly reminiscent of Earth. Not only Pluto, but fascinating discoveries were made about Pluto's moons as well. Charon, the largest moon, was seen to have a complex and intriguing terrain. And Pluto's four smaller moons were found to have unprecedented orbits and rotation, which NASA has yet to explain properly. But sadly, this could be the last time pictures like these of Pluto are seen for a very long time. Although data transmission continues, New Horizon has now left the dwarf planet behind and is on its way to the Kuiper Belt, with the chances of another close-up look at Pluto unlikely in the foreseeable future. Quan Zhao, Arirang News. Living in a highly connected, fast-paced society can sometimes make us want to get away from it a little. With more Koreans seeking a respite from hectic city life, some are choosing to recharge their batteries and enjoy what's been coined as the book stay experience. We've heard of homestay, temple stay, and farm stay. But for you bookworms out there, book stay or bed and books. Our news feature tonight with Oh Soo Young. Sometimes the distractions of a modern-day lifestyle can make it difficult to finish a book in one sitting. That's why in recent months, more and more Koreans have been seeking refuge at remote hideaways, where they can stay up all night reading a book or two, or even write one of their own. There are now six of these so-called book stay ins throughout the country, providing these overnight reading retreats. Located less than an hour's drive from the capital of Seoul, this bookstay guesthouse is one of the biggest in the country, attracting people of all ages and backgrounds. Whenever I worried or questioned my path in life, reading books provided relief. That's how I began collecting books, and I wanted to share that with others so that they could also find answers to their questions. Those looking to spend some quality time and rest from their busy lives visit on weekends or holidays, and they mostly come alone. You can take your pick of more than 13,000 books stacked on the rows and rows of shelves, covering everything from fantasy and romance to philosophy and travel guides. You can sit down with your choice in one of the open areas or in your very own room. With mellow colour schemes and minimalist furnishing, each room is designed to trigger inspiration and introspection. Books are filled with personalities and thoughts of many different people. Staying here and being surrounded by books makes me feel as if I'm conversing with them. I can spend quiet time alone in a remote place with a chance to reflect on myself. Book stays have emerged as part of a wider trend of unique overnight experiences, including the chance to stay at a lighthouse, museums and even prison-themed homes. In our modern society, people create human networks, do business and gain information through the Internet and media. Since everything is interconnected through digital devices, people often choose to enjoy more manual or analog activities when they can. Reading books, for instance, is physical, analog activity that complements the natural biological needs of the human body. These accommodations are located a safe distance away from busy, bustling cities, providing not only a breath of fresh air and a brand new experience, but also much desired solitude, simplicity and time for self-reflection. Holidays are normally about eating good food, sightseeing and going to tourist attractions, but these stay experiences are about rest and detaching oneself from the fast-paced society. Experts say these stay accommodations will continue to be sought out by modern Koreans.
Our capitalistic society has the tendency to pit people against each other in competition, starving people of their fundamental needs. So these spaces, which fulfill those needs, will continue to be in demand and have the potential to grow into an alternative culture. It's said that life is like a book. And sometimes, reading between the lines requires us to deliberately take a step back from our everyday surroundings. Oseong Arirang News. EU leaders are meeting in Brussels with the Prime Minister of Turkey to try and cut a deal that would significantly slow the flow of migrants into Europe. Bruce Harrison joins me now with more on the tough negotiations. Uh, now, Bruce, what are the basics of this deal? Well, essentially, Kanyang, these EU leaders have offered Turkey uh, political and other concessions if Turkey agrees to help stop migrants from reaching Greece. And that's been the main point of entry into Europe of migrants fleeing Syria and other war-torn countries. Uh, so right now, what would hold up the deal? Sure. Well, they're meeting right now, and even if the leaders can't overcome possible uh, objections from Turkish Prime Minister Ahmet Davutoglu, um, it's been revealed that some of the leaders have doubts whether this deal can be made workable. And on top of that, and some of them are concerned whether it's even legal under international law. Uh, French President Francois Hollande said the deal has to be comprehensive if it's going to work. Which means it applies to Turkey, since Turkey will agree to readmit to take back migrants who arrive from Turkey via Greece and who are not able to assert their rights. Turkey will take these migrants back. Prime Minister Davutoglu says the EU and Turkey have the same goals and objectives, especially to help Syrian refugees. I am sure, I hope, uh, we will be uh, achieving our goal to help see, uh, all the refugees as well as to deepen Turkish-EU relations, which is a good news for our continent and for the, for the humanity altogether. Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan criticized EU leaders on Friday. He said Turkey is already hosting three million refugees, and those unable to find space for a handful of refugees must first look at themselves. Brazilians are protesting in the streets over President Dilma Rousseff's appointment of her predecessor as her chief of staff. Critics say the appointment of former President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva is an attempt to shield him from prosecution on corruption charges. Some protesters say they won't leave the streets until Rousseff resigns. I am here to support this protest against corruption that made all the public money that should have been used for schools and hospitals disappear. And I am talking about all political parties. Others have defended Lula's record, saying the media is trying to destroy his image. We can't forget it was Lula's government that took 32 million people out of poverty. Amid the protest, a federal judge issued an injunction to block Lula's appointment, saying it goes against the free exercise of justice. Now, Bruce, uh, Brazil is in a state of crisis over its leadership, and it goes much deeper than De Silva's appointment. Sure, people are still on the streets, and, you know, um, for one, Rousseff is in the crosshairs of another investigation. Congress actually just started impeachment proceedings uh, over allegations she broke campaign spending laws in 2014. So there's multiple layers to the uh, political unrest right now in Brazil. Right. So Brazil, we all know that Zika virus um, is, is being widespread there. And on top of that, now this uh, corruption scandal, they're all threatened to overshadow the Rio Olympics in August. In August, that's going to be uh, tough things to overcome as they're getting ready for one of the biggest events in the world. Well, let's, uh, we'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed for that. All right. All right. Thank you, Bruce, for today and all of this week. No problem. Well, I can tell you that today was probably one of the most pleasant days here in Seoul this week. So let's see if we can continue to have favorable weather throughout the weekend. We check in with our E. Han at the Weather Center. Jihan, it was uh, pretty warm today. What was, uh, what was the highest temperature here in the nation's capital? 
Hello, Gunyang. Don't be surprised to hear this digits. The capital saw the mercury going up to 20.1 degrees Celsius, making it feel almost like late April. Definitely, for sure. Then uh, the big question is, what's the weather going to be like for the upcoming weekend? I mean, hopefully there's no fine dust to interrupt all of our outdoor activities. Well, I hate to let you down, but actually tomorrow we are expecting a high level of fine dust in most parts of the country, including here in the capital. But the air quality could improve by Sunday, but be sure to check the forecast before heading out. And unlike rainy southern provinces, the upper parts of the country have a very warm day with a good amount of sunshine. And over the weekend, temperature readings will remain above the seasonal averages under a good amount of sunshine. And this is definitely good news for the nearly 30,000 participants in the 2016 Seoul International Marathon, which will be held this Sunday. Uh, there will be a partial road closure from 7.50 a.m. to 1.35 p.m. this Sunday from Gwanghwamun Plaza to the east gate of Jamsir Sports Complex. So beware of some heavy traffic near the area. On that note, let's move on to tomorrow's temperature readings. Daily low here in Seoul and Daejeon will kick off at 7 degrees Celsius, while Busan and Jeju will start out at 11 and 10. And as for the daily highs, here in the capital, Daegu and Busan and Gwangju will all top out at 18 degrees Celsius tomorrow afternoon. Now, next week might not be as warm as this week, with a high gradually reaching down to the low teens by the end of next week, and no rain is in the forecast for the time being. Now that's Korea for you, and here's the international weather for viewers around the world. Well, that is our broadcast on this Friday night. I'm Moon Gang Yun, but I hope you all of you make sure and enjoy the spring flowers and spring flower festivals all across Korea if you're here um, over the weekend. And next week, we hope to bring you more warm and toasty news during our News Center. And we will see you right back here, same time next week on Monday on News Center.